there's a sentence in the report, England's planning system has a curious void where its spatial direction should be. The planning system has become a mechanism for development control rather than placemaking a new development. It has not been muscular enough to direct growth to the right locations. Rather, it has let it happen where objections are fewest. Welcome to The Green Urbanist, a podcast for urbanists fighting climate change. I'm Ross. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode. Today's episode is a conversation with Sean Spears. Yeah, I'm Sean Spears. I'm executive director of Green Alliance, which is a a think tank working for ambitious leadership on the environment topic of our conversation centers around um, a publication by Green Alliance titled Build Up, the Environmental Case for New Homes in Sustainable Locations. So in this uh, conversation, we really pull together the threads of the English planning system, the housing crisis that we're facing here, and also uh, the environmental implications of how we build homes, where we build them, in what form, etc. We recorded this episode quite a few months ago, actually. Um, but I'm publishing it now because we have a new government here in the UK. We have a Labour government um, who have come in uh, pushing for a lot of planning reform. Uh, they're already starting to uh, look at reforming uh, planning, like the National Planning Policy Framework, etc. A lot of what Labour is proposing to do is really about reducing restrictions, planning restrictions, uh, and trying to get more house building happening. Sean makes the case uh, in this uh, conversation and in the report that actually that's not really how these things work and that what we really need if we want to get the right uh, the right outcomes for sustainability and in terms of solving the housing crisis is we need more planning not less and as he says what we need is a more muscular planning system that can look strategically and plan for these things and tie together um, transport with housing delivery with other uses and infrastructure which is sadly just missing here in the uk so uh re- i think quite an interesting conversation to listen to while all this talk of planning reform is happening here in the uk and in england um and i hope you hope you find it interesting big thanks to sean for joining me for the conversation uh just to say in general i know i've been sort of off the airwaves for the last couple of months been uh, very very busy doing other stuff but and now life has opened up slightly now uh, and i'm planning more episodes i'm getting more uh, more guests on to do interviews so hopefully you should get some more regular episodes coming up in the next couple of weeks and months um so yeah i look forward to hearing from you uh let me know what you thought of this episode um you can access links to the report uh, and the green alliance website in the episode description there's a link in there there's also a link to a contact form so you can email me directly uh, and i'd love to hear your thoughts thanks very much fantastic um so we wanted to talk today in particular about green alliance's report build up which came out uh last december um and yeah just t- tell me where does this come from what was the motivation behind it and uh, and what's it about in general it's a slightly odd uh, thing for Green Alliance to have done. We haven't done a lot of work on planning, a little bit of work, but we not not a lot. And my colleague, Zoe Averson, who, who's now left Green Alliance and joined the civil service, Zoe uh, asked to do the report. We have kind of incredibly bright policy advisors and, and policy analysts, and she teamed up with Priced Out, the... Uh, I suppose the, 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 the clue is in, in the name, the, the campaign to get more housing, particularly for younger people, um, who funded the report. Uh, so it was a relatively unusual collaboration. It was an interesting one for me because I had been at the Campaign to Protect Rural England, CPRE, for many years. And uh, I don't say we always saw eye to eye with Priced Out. <laughs> but what I was absolutely clear on is that we need to build lots more housing. So what 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 is so the the full title of the report is build up uh, the environmental case for new homes in sustainable locations. Um, so you're obviously taking quite a, an environmental viewpoint of new housing, and I think sometimes people feel delivering the hundreds of thousand homes we uh, a year that we need is quite contradictory to sort of uh, environmental aims and, and the drive for net zero. So what, how do you sort of <laughs> pull those things together? Yeah, I think we're not going to achieve environmental aims and net zero and restoring nature unless you carry people with you. So if you've got a major failing of the state of society, which is 
poor housing, poor quality housing, too many people living in poor quality housing, too many young adults having to live at home because they can't afford housing, too many people spending far too much on rent or, or having smaller um, rented accommodation because they can't afford big more space, etc. then you need to do something. And the question is, what do you do? And Labour at the moment are making great play of bulldozing planning, which is mm. kind of fine as a slogan and presumably works well in focus groups, but it's, it's really not enough. You need to know how, how are you going to build these the homes that the country needs uh, in ways that don't cause huge damage to the environment, that don't increase our car dependency, don't uh, massively increase carbon emissions, and so on. And the answer to that is more planning, not less, and a focus of development on existing urban areas rather than allowing sprawl into the countryside. Mm. Uh, and I was, I was really pleased that we managed to get a report where, although priced out, uh, had a disclaimer on it, they didn't agree with the um, centrality of spatial planning as, as one of the recommendations in the report. Nevertheless, I think they did um, broadly endorse the, the thrust of the report, which is to build up in urban areas which is where people want to live, where the jobs are. Uh, and we know also there are kind of carbon benefits there in, in terms of heating. The, the uh, International Planning Panel on Climate Change has, has said that uh, um, uh, identify compact cities as an important way to mitigate climate change. You get less car use, you, you get more efficient heating and so on. So it all makes sense. Um, you, you do a really good job in the report in the front part of like using these incredible statistics to just paint a picture for people of how, you know, how, how d difficult the housing crisis is at the moment in, in the UK. And I've pulled out a few of them. So I was just looking through earlier. It says the, the average home, uh, the, the cost of uh, an average home in 1997 was 3.5 times average earnings. And now that is 9.1 times. So it's nine times your average earnings for an average house. That is just incredible rise and really not that much amount of time at all. Um, yeah, ex ex exactly. And also the, the amount of space occupied by each private renter has fallen from 34.1 square meters in 1996 to 28.6 square meters in 2018. So much less space to have your stuff and uh and to, to, to have a decent life, which I think we particularly felt in, in lockdown when people were yeah. turning their homes or flats into offices. Certainly, I felt that with colleagues at, at Green Alliance. Um, not all of that is down to supply. I've never believed that si there's a sort of simple causal relationship between mm. supply and price. And governments have um, liked house price inflation. They've seen it as a way to win elections. The new Labour funded a lot of their programmes out of kind of rising, uh, the rising value of stamp duty and so on. Uh, I think it's now got to a stage where I think everybody realises that we just need to build more homes and we need to control house price inflation. Mm. So we have, we have an undersupply issue and we have a price issue and they're related, but they're also distinct, I suppose. I think so. Yeah, I don't think there's a kind of really, really clear causal relationship because also housing is is a sort of investment, um, and so you know, lots of people have lots of houses or, or just want bigger houses. Uh, so I don't, I don't think it's and and every every country in the world in its in its big cities, New York, Berlin, Paris, London, within the UK, Manchester as well. You know, there are um, there is house price inflation that's not clearly linked to supply. I'm not saying there's no relationship with supply, but it's not a direct causal relationship. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, this is, is you mentioned that in the report as well around, around just how much of our economy is tied up in housing and rising house prices. And what was it? The amount the amount of money tied up in housing rose from 1.6 trillion in 1995 to 8.1 trillion in 2020. And that ever rising house prices encouraged people to invest money in property rather than in more productive activities. Um, so this is like a real economic <laughs> conundrum of how do we sort of untangle all of this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's a cultural conundrum as well. I mean, you know, how are, are, are people uh, obsessed by house, housing and house prices because it's the way to make money or to, to mm. fund their retirement? Or is it this sort of cultural thing of the Englishman's home is his castle and, and mm -hmm. so on? And, and I... <laughs> Books have been written on this, but not by me. <laughs>
<laughs> so uh, let's get back to planning. So I'm really interested to hear, uh, you know, the, the, the English planning system is, I think, uh, quite strange uh, internationally when you compare it to other, how other countries do planning. What, what is the connection between our current planning system and the housing crisis? I think there's there's a sentence in the report, England's planning system has a curious void where its spatial direction should be. Right. And, and this is the, uh, I suppose, the lack of, well, again, I'll, I'll read from the report. The planning system has become a mechanism for development control rather than placemaking and new development. It has not been muscular enough to direct growth to the right locations. Rather, it has let it happen where objections are fewest. So mm. this is directly a call for active muscular planning to to make places better to identify land if necessarily if necessary to compulsory purchase them uh, it's not in in this report but it's in my my book i think i, I got this from the um, town and country planning association and and um uh, Hugh, Hugh ellis but the price the, the 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 when milton Keynes was first developed land contributed um around one percent to the cost of new homes because Buckinghamshire County Council to protect the countryside of Buckinghamshire um, decided to build a, a whole new town in Milton Keynes, now city. Um, that's unimaginable now that you'd have that kind of confidence from the centre right to say to landowners, we're not going to give you the uplift in land value. So we know there's a massive increase in the value that uh, landowners get if they get planning permission. I don't think we'll ever get to a stage, nor should we, where you compulsory purchase simply at agricultural values, which was Churchill's proposal mm-hmm. in the Second World War, you know, an incredibly uh, incredible confidence in an active state. <laughs> but you can compensate landowners decently for, um, for, for developing their land for housing. Uh, so they, they make a, a reasonable return, but not a, not a kind of 10 or 20 or 100 times the value of the, the land as it stands without planning permission. And that's been one of the problems. That's one of the, the reasons for rising um, land costs has been the whole just doing nothing about land values, um, the whole business of urban development corporations, building new towns, properly planning urban extensions, etc. We've kind of lost that confidence in the last mm. 40 years. And there's just been a sense, oh, the market will provide. But well, clearly the market hasn't provided. What, what, what do you think is the role of... Um, local authorities getting back into building uh, social housing, affordable housing, etc. It's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because uh, you, you need a sort of massive um, recovery of the ability of local authorities to, to do things, including local authority planning departments that have been stripped away and, and consistently cut. So I think most local authorities have lost the ability to, to build massive new houses. Some some have it and some are building council houses uh, and they provide a good return. You know, they, they, there's, there's money to be made out of property, so they provide a good return <laughs> for the ratepayer. Um, but I think it'll be a slow process. Uh, and whether you do it through directly through local authorities or through housing associations, um, I guess will be something that, that a future government will consider. What I don't think you can do is leave, leave it to the kind of oligopoly of big house builders. Uh, and and, what, and there's a very um, interesting book whose title I've just forgotten, but it's by Toby Lloyd and others, um, Rethinking the Econ- Economics of Housing, I think, something like that, mm. but, but which talks about the relationship between the uh, small and medium-sized enterprise builders, small builders, uh, and uh, s- state or council provision. So when we were building lots of council houses, uh, that provided... SME builders with a constant stream of work mm, yeah, yeah. during low times when when there was a recession or interest rates were high or whatever, and then they could they they could survive those dips and and housing crises. What's happened in the last forty years since we stopped building council houses is that when there's a recession, those SME builders have just gone out of business, and so it's increasingly yeah, yeah, yeah. left to Persimmon and Red Row and the the big guys, and they have absolutely no interest in building on the scale that we need. Mm. It's not in their business model, or in or in the locations and with the urban forms that we need, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is a curious thing because it does feel like I think we do we do often point the blame at um, both large house builders and local authorities when we see 
you know, low density suburban homes built in the countryside, no connection to local area, no train station, anything like that. And we think, how could they let this happen? But it's it's interesting to think of it as a it's an outcome of a planning system that that sort of encourages that kind of behavior. Um in in the way that, you know, it's very it's very opportunistic, it's very um market driven, and there's there's very little actually to push um uh, developers to build in in more sustainable locations, or or local authorities to have the teeth to to actually force them to do so, or to refuse unsustainable development. Um, so we've talked a little bit. I think, I think um, I'm just wondering in terms of listenership. I think a, some people who will be listening will be based in England, probably work in the planning system all the time. Some people will probably be less familiar with it. Um, so I think maybe just to give a bit of an overview, um, I think what we're saying is that we had a more of a strategic spatial direction in planning up until about 2010, is that right? And then we got rid of the sort of county level spatial plans that were sort of trying to knit together uh, development. Before, before then, the, 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 the county level went before then, I'm mm. pretty sure. But um, uh, the, what, what went in 2010 was the regional level. So gotcha. re- re- regional planning was an attempt to join up transport planning, employment, uh, housing, and and so on, uh, energy infrastructure, which is going to be increasingly important. Mm. Uh, the, the regions were considered to be um, lack democratic legitimacy. Kind of, you know, Kent was joined with Oxfordshire. There, there was no real with a hole in the middle for London. Mm. There was no real sense that people lived in regions. The most uh, homogeneous region, arguably, was the northeast, small region, strong cultural identity. But the, it was the northeast that rejected regional planning in its or regional government in its referendum uh, quite early in the um in the new labor times and, and they and the regional planning never got back its democratic legitimacy after that mm. wow that's so interesting there's that big push for localism and this idea that actually we can just solve these things at a much smaller spatial scale yeah and and some of that localism i'd really welcome i think what the conservatives did in 2010 when they came in with with neighborhood planning i mean neighborhood planning is is great and there are some good examples of it really working uh but it's not in the context of a wider spatial plan (laughs) um and it's not just housing the whole you know we we have a messed up transport system we we have um you know we we have no real connection between transport and and planning labor again want to build lots of new towns but how can you do that just through the prism of the town and country planning act you, you and and local authorities um you you will need to create urban development corporations you will need to plan the transport for those places ideally it'll be public transport to fund the public transport you need um uh, land value capture so that you can fund public transport links if you're building uh new towns or or garden cities or whatever they're going to call them uh, then you need to have employment for the people living there unless they're just dormitory towns. You know, you kind of need to think about all this and not just say local is always right. And the other the other thing is, understandably, local people, people who have a stake in the area, don't necessarily see the benefit of new development. They're, they're in the area because they like the area and they're, they're kind of risk averse. So at some point, you, you need to engage with those people. I know that better than most having worked for CPRE <laughs> for 13 years. You need to engage with them. You need to try and get consent. I think you can can get that if you do it properly but at the end of the day you can't give them a veto you, you know there is a there, there are times so the, the sort of principle of planning is that it's a great system for reconciling local and national long-term and short-term social economic and environmental it, it it kind of melds all those things together and comes out with um an outcome that is in the public interest but not necessarily in any one sectional interest so it's difficult stuff, and it's very, very political. Uh, yeah. And the idea that it's you can make it a technocratic exercise is also deluded. I think. think. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think having having sort of gone through university, where I suppose we're taught the sort of technical aspects of planning and urban design, in terms of you know we sort of know we've known for decades what what is sort of what is the sort of you know uh, sustainable urban forms, how you promote active travel transit oriented development all these concepts have been around for for a long time and then you sort of get into the real world and you realize actually this is just 
so caught up in in politics, in economics, in who's benefiting from the current system, and all these all these things, which is what makes it so difficult to untangle. Um, but I suppose what's interesting is that lots of other countries seem to do it much better than us. <laughs> um, do, do you have any thoughts on that or any examples? They do, yeah, and there are there are some great examples in there. And I mean, obviously, every country is different, um, mm. but, but the you know the car dependency in Atlanta and Barcelona is often compared. The, the report talks about Barcelona's sort of eye watering. Um, density parts of mm. Barcelona with fifty thousand people per square kilometer, and it says that the, the most dense part of London is is less than twenty thousand, which is made of ale, which is actually a pretty desres area. Mm. And Barcelona, of course, is a humming city that people want to visit and go to and and, and live in. So yeah, there are um, good examples. I, um, I went years ago to Vauban in Freiburg. Uh, mm. um, it's slightly unfortunate that. Kind of, there's a steady stream of planners and urbanists, etc., going to Vauban. You, you would like to think there was an example in the UK by now, after <laughs> yeah. twenty or thirty years of coach trips uh, there. But that's that's um, all. Uh, all households within four hundred meters of a tram stop was the plan. Uh, the the report gives the example of the Stockholm Loop, which aims to build one hundred twenty thousand houses close to twelve public transport stops in the city suburbs, with a fifty percent reduction in car use. Per dwelling, and there would be good examples from the UK. There are some sort of you know good good developments in the UK as well, um, but you do need to carry people with you, and this was the problem. Labour's, um, or actually, I don't think it was Labour. I think it was introduced by by John Gummer under the Major government. But, but PPG three policy guidance note three, which recommended a uh, densities average densities of thirty to fifty dwellings per hectare was considered by many to be kind of high rise people just thought <laughs> i remember talking to local councillors about it when i was at cpre they thought no you can't possibly have densities of that size um there's a great book by my former colleague nick scone uh, called, called um um called i'm so bad with names <laughs> it's a great book by nick scone uh, where he sits down with planners from Llewellyn davis including martin crookston who was later on the um uh, urban task force uh, and plots out how you could build kind of a really attractive uh, mixed-use housing at 50 dwellings per hectare on a with sort of family homes and a, on a square with a garden in the middle, mm. a bit like the developments in Coyne Street, um, some single apartments, some family homes, looking quite attractive, three-storey. You know, you can do this stuff, but yeah. you need to plan it. You need to do it well, and you don't need to just do the kind of cookie-cutter estates that you see now – sprawling all over england yeah and i think to to that point maybe one final statistic from me just because i (laughs) found them so helpful for illustrating the point but it was between 2011 and 2019 only 17 percent of new homes were built in well-connected neighborhoods within a 10 minute walk of a train station 17 percent like what an absolute failing of of spatial planning um so i think we've, we've we've sort of laid out what is i suppose some of the issues uh, yeah. Can I just between... just say, sorry to interrupt, but that 17% is a shocking statistic. It's 70% in London, which yeah. is an area that does have a spatial plan because the, the mayor has greater power. So that, again, shows what you can do. Um, another example in, in the report is of Coventry, which, except for a single square kilometre in the centre of the city, has a – sets a um, – Density standard of thirty-five dwellings per hectare, which you know, in spite of there being lots of suburban train stations with good routes into Coventry or mm. Birmingham or whatever, so we are planning for um, sprawling low density development. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, it might be a good time to get onto some of the recommendations that are in the report. Um, what would you do for the planning system, in a sense? Well, um, strategic spatial plans is uh, for cities is 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 one. Um, strengthening the MPPF on transport oriented development is is another. Um, there is uh, perhaps a more controversial recommendation about allowing local development orders um, for suburban areas. I think that has to be in the context of a kind of clear spatial plan, um, but but e- easing the need for planning permission to develop. Um, around stations in suburban areas. Mm. Uh, 
all all this stuff will will need to be properly interrogated. Uh, I know, you know there are stations in the London Greenbelt where you you kind of frequently see them in presentations by people who want to build over them uh, where where they just kind of an isolated station surrounded by horses with just a car park <laughs> next to it and it looks bonkers why don't you build lots of developments around there in some cases that would be appropriate in other cases actually the idea that all the people who live in the developments near the station are just going to commute in and out of london mm. of course they won't they'll they'll want to get to other places they'll want a car they'll want s- schools in the end uh, medical services shops so you will get sprawl into what is currently open countryside which is the point mm. of of the green belt so we need to be careful how we do it but I think we've all we'll all go to sort of suburban areas where you'll see a, a railway station, um, and 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 it's not very pleasant. But there's a kind of um, yeah, it's just sprawling, low level development, not really able to sustain any shops. And you think you could make that a real, you know, great place to live, a real hub with a bit of imagination. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think. Um... Uh, the local development orders aspect uh, it reminds me in a sense of uh what's happening at the moment with design codes um yeah. d- design coding has really come in to the forefront in planning in the uk almost well in england almost seemingly as a hoping to solve all of our problems in a sense of sort of that's going to be the new proactive planning thing which is that local authorities are going to put together a design code for for their whole area yeah. and then that's going to make the you know the development control aspect of planning much more straightforward and and uh, consistent um i think having spoken to lots of local authority officers uh, about this you know it's not it's nowhere near going to be as simple as that and and we don't really have the skills in the public sector at the moment to really do this yet but it seems like that ties in quite well to this idea of of local development orders yes um i I think all all this stuff needs to be in the context of design codes and in the and in the context of special plans so so it's it's not a free-for-all so again the one of the recommendations of the report is to um is to experiment at least with street votes where you could where residents in, in given area can vote on easing planning controls and people can have extensions or redevelop their their houses um but with with a design code so so mm. that the area improves rather than than not um so yeah so i i, I you know I, I think i am in favor of design codes design codes were kind of swept away when the mppf was brought in national planning policy framework um by the coalition government and that was all an attempt to really really simplify planning and and mm. they got away they did away also with um s- supplementary planning orders and and so on but um planning is a hard thing to simplify planning is complex <laughs> creating the places we want to live in is, is complex uh and i think anybody who goes around and looks at the quality of some new developments would really think yeah we do need um some design codes i just would hope that they are uh, the, they are imaginative. Um, mm. One of the things I did when I wrote my book was visit custom built, self built housing in Amsterdam, and I saw the kind of most wonderful modern, funky homes you could imagine. Yeah, yeah. And then went to a self built development in in the UK, which was just looked like just another kind of Barrett's estate. And um, I, th- I think we can do better. <laughs> well, I would I would hope so. I would hope so. Um, you have an interesting uh, part of the report, which is about um, why retaining existing buildings is not always the most environmentally uh, beneficial thing to do, and that there can be an argument for a demolish and densify uh, approach. Yes, um, and this is my my colleague Zoe, who is the lead author of the report, who uh, is was a Green Lines policy analyst, and therefore loves facts and <laughs> data and I, I think the argument is 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 clear that um al- although we are all increasingly concerned by embodied carbon and by the the cu- climate cost of of giving buildings short lifespans if you if you replace sort of low density d- dwellings with many more dwellings on the same footprint um then in a relatively short period of time you do get a carbon saving 
Uh, again, I think it needs to be site specific and needs, and we need to consider the heritage and cultural aspect. So I, I'm, you know, a great fan of reusing you know, the flats in, in some of the old mills in, around Manchester um, are, are fantastic Des Rose places. The, the charity Save, Save Britain's Heritage has done brilliant work on trying to repurpose grand existing buildings uh, and, and keeping the embodied carbon, but also keeping the character of the area. Mm-hmm. So um, it's certainly not an argument for sweeping away heritage. And I think we always need to think carefully about how we reuse wonderful old buildings because people like the character of an area. Um, but it's not a clinching argument. You do need to look at every aspect of it. Yeah, I think like something that I really feel has, has happened in the last couple of years within the built environment professions is that I think architects and engineers have been extremely good at moving forward with um best practice guidance and and research um and recommendations around how to achieve net zero carbon or how to drastically reduce uh, emissions within the sort of building you know looking at individual buildings and i think it's once you move beyond buildings to a place based analysis it becomes so much more complex and much more difficult actually to uh you know calculate things accurately uh, but also just wasting things so i think but I think it's absolutely necessary. It really needs to happen. So, so I think taking that thing of looking at, you know, use the the example in the report of if you have fifty, you know, semi detached homes by a by a train station, you know, what's the most environmentally beneficial thing to do there? Is it to continue the sprawl into the surrounding area, um, or is it to you know redevelop those fifty homes into three hundred apartments? And um, you know, once you start adding in the um, transport emissions the lifestyle emissions, the um, maybe the ability to make the homes, you know, more environmentally friendly in their operation than the previous homes were. You know, once you start adding all these things up, you start to get a different picture than the more simplistic view, I suppose, we sometimes have, which is just uh, keep keep everything we have, you know, as much as possible. Um, so yeah. I do think that is interesting. Abs- absolutely. And I also think that you can, if you build well, you'll improve the character of the area. A lot of these, these homes are not particularly visually attractive you know, i know we have to be careful about about that because some parts of of the country which are cherished now were reviled at the time they were built and so <laughs> you know it might uh, it might be that opinions will change but a, but the uh, there's a um a thing in the national planning policy framework where it says that um local authorities must provide uh, require plans to provide for new housing except where and I quote, meeting need in full would mean building a density significantly out of character with the existing mm. area. And there are lots of areas, particularly lots of suburbs, where the character will be improved by new Yeah, building. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, I think the placemaking aspect of this is just, is is really, really important as well. And this this thing of just like so much of, of England is sort of, um, feels like nowhere in a sense. You know, we've really lost a lot of our local character in in in, in places, particularly these suburban places. Um, and I think, yeah, I think we, we 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 along with the environmental and the social benefits. And I think it's it's maybe you know having some of these really good, higher density mid rise uh, developments will start to help public opinion shift um, towards actually you know viewing those more favorably. And I think there is a lot of fear sometimes from people. Once anything is higher than two stories, <laughs> they start to feel a bit like, "Oh, what's what's happening? This isn't New York. What are you doing?" Kind of thing. You're like, "Well, it's only you know, <laughs> we're a long yeah. way from that." Though, though, you know, try and get a flat in the Barbican. I mean, people like um, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 really. Um, I mean, I, I think one of the other interesting things about the report is it, it, the, a lot of the debate, of course, is about public opposition to building in the green belt and sprawling into the countryside and. So and that's that's the focus of attention, and that of course is what I was very involved in within CPRE. The CPRE always had a, a very strong urbanist tendency right from its beginning mm. in 1926, and, and Tony Burton from CPRE was on Richard Rogers' Urban Task Force, and Power was a great urbanist and countryside protector, and so on. But there is really also very very strong opposition to building in in towns and in mm. and in dense cities. Uh, and you've seen this with, I mean, the the report quotes the, um, the the campaign to stop building over a car park at, uh, by Cockfosters Tube Station, which I think was led by, it was 351 homes, it was led by the neighbouring MP, Teresa Villiers, who I like and have worked with. 
uh, it's not in the report, but there was another, it, it was had quite a lot of press coverage, was Rupert Huck, the Labour MP, who also like and have worked with um, campaigning against a, a development in the centre of Ealing, which is various mm. people who live in Ealing and love Ealing sort of said, you know, I love Ealing, but it could be improved. <laughs> There's not, it's not a kind of, it's not the Westminster Abbey. Um, <laughs> but you get that sort of opposition in cities as well as in the country countryside the difference is it seems to be more successful in the city so we end up with relatively low density city centers with really low density suburbs and yeah. we continue to have lots of sprawling development at really low density sort of 15 dwellings per hectare in in the countryside um and so that's why i my sort of mantra is more planning not less not the bulldoze mm-hmm. planning but plan properly it's very interesting i mean even the even the suburbs in uh, in other countries are very different, and I've, I haven't quite figured out. I spend a fair amount of time in Italy. My partner is, is Italian, and her parents live in a sort of I suppose you call it a sort of commuter town outside of Milan, about maybe ten twenty kilometers outside of Milan. And there, the suburbs there are just like you would never see the sort of you know thirty two DPH semi detached homes there. It's just culturally just doesn't happen. So the where they live is like built in the sixties and seventies, has a metro stop. Uh, in the middle of the countryside, but everything is five and six story apartment blocks. And it's just, you know, it just like totally baffles me because I'm just like, I'm like what planning system was in place that, 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 that happened here. But at the same time in the UK, we were, you know, we were sprawling across the countryside and it's, it's just a fascinating sort of question of, of, of culture and, and history of how these things happen. It is, isn't it? And I mean, Scotland has a different culture, certainly in the cities of so the tenement blocks and, and, in Edinburgh, I think it's built more densely. But Ireland is very like the English system, isn't it? Lots mm. of lots of sprawling, low density development. And I yeah. guess every country is different in its approach. Um, before we move on to talking about your book, uh, which I guess we've touched on some points on uh, already, is there anything else from the report you wanted to bring up? Um. Well, it's a. Uh, it's, I, I suppose the, uh, maybe it's implicit what I've said, but the, you talk about the, the recommendations, and mm. um, one of the recommendations is to, to strengthen the powers of local authorities to um, regenerate and develop their areas. So it is, right. it, you started off by saying were they capable of building houses themselves, and I think that's something we should aspire to. It might take a bit of time, but we should also really aspire to strengthen local planning authorities and, and the confidence of local areas to to plan possibly starting with the metro mayors who've got more um who've got larger scale you know i look at my own, lo- own local planning of my own local planning authorities it's got its, it's it's got enough problems i'm not sure it's going to be really um very well equipped to do this this quickly but we're going to have to get there um mm. uh and to be honest labor's plan to create an th- extra 300 planning officers is really not worth talking about I mean, there's, there's less than one planning officer per local authority there's going to be a need of a real investment mm. in planning and planners to enable better place making yeah absolutely i mean i think it's just it's it's not um it's not a, a hard <laughs> problem to sort of an- analyze when you just see how much uh budgets have been cut how many less uh, how much uh uh, planning departments have really suffered and hollowed out um, over the last couple of years, uh, and I think yeah, any any aspiration to a more active and proactive planning system obviously has to have you know funding attached to it. But presumably that all pays for itself many times over in terms of reduced emissions, you know, uh, greater health and well being in the population from having healthier places, you know, all of these things. It it must be a uh, <laughs> an incredibly good investment for the government to make. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think so, provided the planning system allows local authorities to plan properly, which at the moment it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay, well, that, that was great. I, yeah, uh, there'll be a link to the that report um, in the episode description, and I really encourage people to go and, and read through it. It's very it's very well written, like it's very um, approachable, and it's not sort of overly long or, <laughs> or difficult to get through, which is, which is very welcome. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's have a chat about your book, How to Build Houses and Save the Countryside. Where did this come from? Oh, it's also very short and it's a cracking read. I, I assure you. It's, so I was at CPRE for 13 years um, and I, I so campaigned for rural England, had a kind of reputation for 
being nimby for trying to stop development, for knowing what it didn't want rather than what it did want. Um, much of it unfair. Uh, and my own background, kind of political background, was more on the social side. It was the first environment organisation I'd worked for. And I certainly didn't go into it trying to stop people bettering their lives and, and living mm. in decent homes. Um, and I spent, I suppose I spent a lot of time giving more or less the same speech, writing the same blog. And I wanted to just take some time out to think about what would, how we could create a better planning system that really could protect the countryside, um, but increase development and recognising also that countryside was being lost, that more green belt was being lost than non green belt land. You know, there were a lot of pressures. Um, so how could you do this better? Not by saying no, um, <clears throat> no loss of countryside, and that's feasible. You know, when when the last Labour government had a sixty percent brownfield target, um, CPRE advocated an eighty percent brownfield target, mm. and, and for, for, I think for one or two years that was achieved, but never advocated a hundred percent brownfield <laughs> target. Um, so that was the, the the book was an attempt to kind of think through my ideas. Um, and be slightly semi-detached from CPRE. So I was able to say things about how you would build in the green belt rather than just saying mm, yeah. no building the green belt. Green belt is, is sacred. Slightly unfortunately, in a way, I moved to Green Lions halfway through writing the book or just before the book was published. So um, I, I didn't sort of push it enough. Um, in, so it's kind of it's one of the very unread masterpieces of our time. I think it's still still one or two copies, <laughs> still one or two copies left. Uh, but what's slightly depressing about it, it was published in 2018. I don't think it needs much updating. I think the, the system, okay. <laughs> you know, for all the tinkering with the planning system, the main analysis we need more planning, not less. We need to take on land prices. We need to take on the oligopoly of the big builders. We need, if you really care about building homes, you need to build them. We you know half the homes we build, or more than half the homes we built for. 30 years after the Second World War were built by the state. Then mm. all that was swept away in 79. Council houses were sold off. But um, the private sector provision was is more or less consistent since yeah. 1945. Sometimes it's up because there's a housing boom. Sometimes it's down. But the, the, the private sector alone, in my view, will not deliver on the scale that's, that's needed. So there's a whole lot in the book anyway. So, mm. um, yeah, that's a... Canter through. When when you say save the countryside, <laughs> what what yeah. do you mean by that? I I suppose yeah, there's, there's a slightly robotic title, isn't it? But I um but, but save as much countryside as possible, its character, um, uh, and and just not have sort of anodyne sprawl. There's there, I I use some local examples. I now live in Rochester in Medway, and I, I quote a report. I think it's either from the Institute of Economic Affairs or the Adam Smith Institute that that say that um, the Medway is kind of joined with Maidstone. Well, actually it isn't. It's, it's got p- part of an area of outstanding natural beauty between it and mm. <laughs> Maidstone. But it's really important to keep that kind of character, that sense that you do have, um, you can have dense development. So in in Medway, Chatham, Strood, Rochester and Raynham kind of all are almost merged and and i think there's some people want them to be made a city the city of medway mm. um but around those four towns there's wonderful countryside there's the river medway there's there's marshland the north downs um and and that matters it, yeah 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 absolutely i mean do, do you have any thoughts i mean we're probably getting a bit off off topic here but i just think there's there's a really fascinating thing happening i think over the coming decades around how our countryside may be changing, um, the character of it and, and how we make use of land as things like nature recovery comes much further up the agenda, even things like rewilding or nature restoration at large scale is becoming much more, I suppose, promoted and accepted by people. Um, and even things like, you know, solar solar power, wind farms, you know, um, forestry, you know, all, all, there's all these sort of environmental land use aspects that I think are now starting to sort of shift maybe how we traditionally would use land um, yeah and 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 land has always changed hasn't it the the yeah. the the kind of hedgerows which are, we, we now love were brought in by the enclosures which uh, people railed against in the 18th century mm. um cpre rutland was set up to 
stop the building of Rutland Water. Uh, its, its main purpose now is to protect Rutland Water and um, <laughs> regard it as a kind of wonderful amenity for the East Midlands, which it is. Uh, the I, I remember the um, campaigns at CPRE against badly sited poly, polytunnels, and there are issues around polytunnels and, and homes for agricultural workers and so on, but we've increased the soft fruit season massively uh, uh, and by kind of growing strawberries and raspberries over a longer season. And I now pass by lots of polytunnels on my commute to London, and you kind of get used to them as you get used mm-hmm. to solar farms. I'm not saying this stuff is unimportant, but the but landscape has always changed. Um, I think, the cha- I think as you hint, the changes we're going to like to see in the next 10 years as we really step up measures to combat climate change are, are going to be massive. If we don't step up those measures, then the countryside is going to change because of drought and flooding and yeah. ex- extreme extreme weather. But the scale of renewable energy infrastructure, particularly pylons from offshore wind, but also onshore wind and solar, is going to change landscapes. And yeah. and a lot of people are going to be really sad about that. And, and we'll need to carry people with us. But it kind of needs to happen if we're going to meet net zero. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I think I really appreciate that mindset of the, the constant evolution uh, and the constant change. And let's just hope that, you know, I think the reality is once you sort of study the the ecology of Britain is that we actually live in a very, we live in one of the most ecologically deprived countries in the world. And so, you know, what we can do in terms of reforesting, renaturalizing, rewilding parts of Britain will be, hopefully it will, it will be a different aesthetic than we're used to, not the neat, tidy agricultural fields necessarily everywhere, but hopefully in time we'll, we'll, we'll come to love that for what it is, which is, you know, hugely beneficial for us and, and for other wildlife. Yeah, no, exactly. And it can be done without massively re- reducing um, food production as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. This has been a great chat. I've really enjoyed this. Any any final points from you, or any sort of, um, I suppose, r- calls to action for for listeners before we we finish up? Well, I think the only call for action, and it's a, it's something I'm sort of mildly obsessed with with the Labour Party. The Labour Party, who look like they're going to win the next election, have uh, got bold plans for planning, but I haven't really got a clue what they are. And <laughs> and, and and the stuff I've read, and I've tried quite hard to dig down, suggests that they. If, if they've if they've thought really deeply about it, they haven't let on, which I sort of understand because they've they've got a small target strategy to win the election. The more they are clear about their policies, the more people attack either attack them or, or nick them. So they might have a great plan for planning, but at the moment, the level of rhetoric is that we're going to planning has got in the way of getting the development the country needs. We're going to sweep away the planning system, and it, that narrative is so superficial. It's exactly what we heard in 2010. It's the narrative of policy exchange, the independent, the Institute of Economic Affairs, the Adam Smith Institute, sweep away planning, and all will be well. Um, and and a it gives too much credence to the idea that planning is stopping building things. Uh, mm. you know, what a, a lot of what is stopping building things is lack of skills, lack of supply chains, lack of diversity in the industry, and so on. But but also it it it's almost an invitation to do things badly, uh, and and when when we've done things well in this country, it's been through as I say quite muscular um, mm. uh, planning with as much democratic consent as you can get. But in the end, it's the business of government, both local and national, to to consult to set out a vision for for better places. And if they screw it up, they'll they'll lose elections. But they can't just defer to the private sector you've got to you've got to plan properly